Our God, our help in ages past and for the years to come. That's a great hymn that we have just sung, and it fits so well in today's uh, sermon. I want to begin, in case you did not get to read the third chapter of the story, which covers a vast expanse of time, but is mainly focused on Joseph's life and the problems that he was ensnared in that were around him. Some were his own problems, and some came from outside by others. Sometimes that happens in both ways. But I want to review the story for a moment, so I'm going to uh, play our, our short video here that we play, just in case you didn't get to read, to remind us of the story of Joseph real quickly. Jacob had 12 sons, but his favorite was Joseph. One day, Jacob sent Joseph to check on his brothers who were working in the field. Joseph's brothers resented him, and when they saw him coming, they attacked him and threw him in a well. Then they sold their brother as a slave, took off his coat, soaked it in goat's blood, and showed it to their father, tricking him into believing a wild animal had killed Joseph. Soon after, Joseph was sold to a military official in Egypt as a servant. God helped Joseph do great work, and the official was very happy with him. Joseph was very handsome, and the official's wife tried day after day to seduce him. One day, she pressured Joseph so much that he ran out of the house, leaving his coat behind. She told everyone that he tried to force himself on her. The official was furious and threw Joseph in jail. God once again helped Joseph in all he did and eventually he was put in charge of all the prisoners helping run the jail. Joseph had the special ability to interpret people's dreams. One day, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, asked Joseph to interpret one of his dreams. He dreamed that seven fat cows were eaten by seven skinny cows, and seven heads of healthy grain were eaten up by seven heads of dried up grain. God helped Joseph interpret the dream. Egypt would experience seven years of successful farming, followed by seven years of famine. Pharaoh was impressed and put Joseph second in charge of Egypt. During the famine, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt looking for food. When they got there, they met with Joseph, but didn't recognize him right away. When Joseph finally told them who he was, they wept because they were sorry for what they had done. Eventually, they went and got their father, Jacob, and brought him back to Egypt. Joseph took care of his entire family, giving them property in the best part of the land where they lived for the rest of their lives. All right. Just a quick overview of what uh, we're, we're looking at today. Um, we are faced in the story, this third chapter, with a difficult question about Joseph and really about our lives. Why does God allow our present sufferings? Why does He allow those things to continue? Why did He allow them to happen to, to Joseph? Now, this is not a discussion on philosophy and the nature of human beings. We're not going to go there. It's not a, a struggle with uh, how we look at the devil, where he came from, or why God continues to let him have power in the world that we live in. We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about the wisdom of God today in Him putting the tree in the garden. That was a couple chapters ago. We're not going to go there. We face suffering like Joseph did in his life every day. Why? Why does God allow the present suffering in our lives? I, to remind you a bit of what we know and what we've read this week, Joseph was on a seesaw of ups and downs. It was hills and valleys constantly for a number of years in Joseph's life. It, it, it 17, these seesaws really started. It really got bad. Imagine yourself at 17 if you faced some of the things that he faced. He was loved by his dad. He enjoyed special favor. 
But that was not taken well by brothers, and that turned into a number of events that came into being. And the first one was, you know what? Let's just kill our brother and be done with them. Can you imagine family members saying that and doing that? The problem is, is we do hear that in the news way too often. But that they didn't kill him. What they did is they threw him into a well, a sister in a dry well, and, and there they had an opportunity to debate what they were going to do with him. And there was a little split between the brothers, if you remember the story. And then they finally decided on making a little money off of it, and so they sold him into slavery. And these were not easy things. 17 years old. He gets carried off to a foreign land in shackles and in chains, and he is sold on the block, and there the seesaw kind of comes back a little bit for him. Even though he's in slavery, he becomes the head of Potiphar's household. But his problems don't stop there. His suffering doesn't stop there. He goes back down into the valley again when a woman comes along, Potiphar's wife, and says, Joe, I think we're alone now, and has the opportunity to maybe uh, not behave the way that he should with a woman who wasn't his wife. And he runs. And even in that upright, standing, moral fiber that he had, that he knew that it wasn't right and he ran, he ends up back down deep again. There's lies that are told about him by Potiphar's wife and life in prison. And then it seems to come up a little bit again for Joseph as it rises up while he's in prison. He has the opportunity, though, to not just be in chains behind bars doing nothing, but he is recognized for his gifts. He begins to run the prison for the captain of the guard. He also has the opportunity to do some dream interpretation for a couple people. And then, even though he's kind of risen up he still sinks down to the bottom again as he's forgotten about. The person that he interpreted one of the dreams for said, I'll remember you. He was asked to be reminded when the time is right. But the man forgot about him as he was serving the king until some time later. But he must have been very, very downhearted and downcast at times. Going through all these things, forgotten, thrown in prison, beaten up, smacked down, smacked around, threatened to be killed, sold into slavery, lies told about him. This is a hard life. It's sufferings. And it leaves us, why does God allow our present sufferings in these troubles? And Christians, we answer that question. But we don't always answer it very well. We need to be careful about how we answer that question. Because I know there are good meaning people, and I've probably even done it myself, who've answered the question with this one. It's not sufferings. It's blessings in disguise. Like that's going to make you feel better. Right? Let's be honest with ourselves. If I ever say that to you, would you please hit me upside the head? And say, Pastor, what are you thinking of? It's a nice platitude, but it's not the reality. Sufferings hurt. I'm going to invite you, if you got the book, the story with you, uh, to turn to page 3. If you don't have it, I'm going to, I'm going to read it here for you. Or, excuse me, page uh, 42 in chapter 3. Okay, And so this is at the end of the reading uh, on page 42. And what we've got here is something we need to struggle with. Joseph says to them, his brothers who are standing before them, and he reveals himself to them as his brother who has been missing, who they thought was dead. He says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. Now, when we hear those words, I hope you get an understanding of maybe why sometimes we want to say, you know what? Hmm, sufferings. 
It's just blessings in disguise. Look at this text. It kind of proves that, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. It can certainly be read that way, but that's not what it's saying. Joseph is not denying that this caused him real pain and real heartache and real hurt. And there were times when he was down and depressed and saddened and hurt. Those things are real for years. What he is saying is this. Not that it's a blessing in the disguise, but that God will work in the midst of it to accomplish something good. He works in the midst of the pain and the brokenness of this world to accomplish His will. To bring about what He desires to have brought about. It's not necessarily that blessing in disguise. We cannot and we should not ever say, that the sufferings that we have in this world don't hurt. There are seasons in our life where the silver lining is not around the cloud, where there are no rainbows, where there is suffering and pain, and it serves, at least in our eyes, no purpose. And the pain that we feel is real because sin is real. And there's a consequence to sin. Right? A husband. A husband cheats on his wife. There's a consequence to that sin. The wife is hurt and feels broken inside. The children cry and their pillows fill up with tears because of the sin that was committed. We see this in chapter 1 of the story. They were chased out of the garden. Creation groans under the weight of sin. Scripture tells us that. There are earthquakes and there are tornadoes and those aren't blessings in disguise. They're not. So why does God allow suffering? Why does He allow that? Why does He allow suffering? Again, sometimes as Christians, we step back and we will say, you're suffering because you have sinned. That's the consequence. You have to pay a price. You know what we kind of call this? (laughs) We're saying that you blew it. That it's your fault. And so God is punishing you And it's based on how well you perform or how well you do not perform. We call that karma. Stay away from this. Please, as Christians, don't go the karma route. Okay? Don't say that. Leave that one away. Leave it out of your conversation. Karma says if you do good things, you get good things. If you do bad things, bad things are going to happen to you. Really? Come on. Do we really believe that lie? Do we really buy in to the karma idea? I'm going to turn... I think we all do. Even Joseph's brothers did. I'm going to ask you at 35, page 35, not go back and look at it another time. The brothers are all gathered together. They're, They're in the midst of some problems. Joseph hasn't revealed who he is yet. And there's... There's some problems going on here. And they said to one another, Surely we're being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we would not listen. That's why this distress comes on us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting of his blood, thinking that he is dead. They're talking about karma. Karma's a problem. We don't believe in karma in Scripture as we look at it as Christians. It's it's not the way it works. You know, when we are driving down the highway, somebody swerves in front of us and they cut us off. We don't say, hey, have a great day. I hope you find ten bucks or win the lottery down the road somewhere. 
Do we? No, we kind of go, <laughs> Why did he do that? Why did she do that? Don't they know how to drive? Where's the horn at? Can't wait to get her hands on the horn. Blow the horn. Well, if we're believing in karma, you see where that leads? Is karma how God deals with sin? Do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. No. Hmm, not at all. Karma doesn't work. God deals with sin through Jesus. Let me ask you a couple questions about Jesus. Jesus ever shoot anybody? Did he ever stab anybody? Did he ever beat anybody up and leave them for dead? Did he ever say, I want this meteor or this bolt of lightning to fall down and hit this person because they keep back-talking me when I'm talking? Is there anywhere recorded in all of Scripture of anything like that of Jesus' doings? Do we see Jesus healing the sick? Do we see Jesus helping and healing the blind? Helping the lame walk? Did He talk about loving your neighbor? And did He live that out? Then why did Jesus have to suffer on the cross? If we believe in karma, if karma is a part of the world, why did Jesus have to suffer on the cross? What was He guilty of? Good things, good results. Bad things, bad results. Something doesn't match up here, right? No, nah, it doesn't work. God deals with our sin by having Jesus deal with it. By laying His life down. When we suffer, it's not karma. It's not the kid's fault when parents go through a divorce, although often a child, and I know this because... My parents went through a divorce. There's a time, even as a young adult, where I thought, this is somehow my fault. I had something to do with it. Cancer doesn't discriminate. Anyone can get it. You can do things that certainly will increase the chances of cancer, but it doesn't discriminate. Tornadoes and earthquakes, fires and floods, do not pass over the holy people and only strike the unholy, the bad people. This is why karma doesn't work. So why does God allow our present sufferings? The question still looms. We watch TV, and as we watch TV, maybe you watch the news, maybe you don't. It can be pretty depressing. The world really stinks. We might pray to God, can you please fix this? Can you please return so you can get us out of here? Thy kingdom come. Will you please come? Right? Leave the rest. Take us. Why are you waiting so long, God? I want you to remember something when you feel that way. I want you to remember not something, but someone. I don't know who it is for you. Maybe it's a daughter or a son or a parent, an uncle, a neighbor, a close friend. Maybe it's somebody that you go see Guardians of the Galaxy with, as Harrison and I did. Maybe it's someone who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior on that list. And I'm looking at this group of people right now. And I can probably name, and I won't, at least ten of you whose heart breaks on a normal basis because your kids and your grandkids have kind of written off the faith. They don't come. They don't believe anymore. You see where I'm going? God is putting off His return of His Son 
so that they have the chance to know who He is. God waits out of love for your son or for your daughter, for your grandchildren. God has promised to make all suffering right. That He was going to dry the tears and He's going to heal disease and He takes the sin away and the violence will stop and pain will disappear. He waits. When we look at our present sufferings and He is waiting, the question comes, How long are you willing to wait? If it meant your son or daughter or grandchild coming to know who Jesus is, are you willing to wait a week? Yeah, I'm sure any of you would. No matter what suffering and pain you're going through. To wait a month? No problem. To wait a year? Absolutely. If that's what it takes for my loved one God works through our present sufferings just like He worked through Joseph's sufferings. His hurt. His pain. And He invites us to trust in Him in the midst of our sufferings to wait with Him. And we're not doing it alone. Why these present sufferings? For the lost. For us to be a witness. To give the lost a chance at salvation and to have life and love with Jesus. God could end it all. He could end it all at any time. The pain, the brokenness, destroy the devil, the unholy with them. And yet there are people that we deeply care for and that He cares much more than we do. And so God waits. And we wait. Do you not think that He suffers as He looks upon us and what we have to go through? It's not His will. It's not His desire for our lives. It wasn't His desire for Joseph to go through all of those things, but He worked through it and Joseph saw it. Think about this. Think on these things. Are you willing to wait a week, a month, a year? Joseph waited. He started this journey at 17. Scripture tells us at 39, he was back together with his family. His dad, his brothers. 22 years he waited. 22 years he suffered the seesaws of ups and downs. And Scripture tells us that he lived to be 110. So he had 71 good years that came after that. Now, I'm not saying they were problem-free. We just don't know. But we do get a piece of what Joseph's life was like. It said Joseph stayed in Egypt along with his father's family. He lived to 110 years and saw a third generation of Ephraim's children, that's his son, and the children of Manasseh, that also is his son. Three generations were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. He got to bounce the babies. That may happen for you, it may not. But we are asked that during the good and the bad, know that God's got His hand in it all. This is the upper story and the lower story. God coming in and touching our lives in the lower story where there's sin and pain and hurt and bringing us through that with His strength. Helping us to wait. To make it through the present sufferings that we feel and deal with each and every day. Hold on to Him. In Jesus' name, Amen.